please cast the most powerful spell you guys are my last hope the fact that this guy was going to those lengths to keep his wife in control and make her love him forever is insane to me Hey everyone, welcome to What Happened with Jackie Flores. I'm Jackie and I'm super, super excited that you guys are listening to my brand new podcast. The feedback has been amazing and I can't wait to get into more cases with you all. Today we'll be doing a deep dive into the disappearance of Maya Miliete and how her case soon turned into a murder investigation. I really wanted to share this case with you guys because this happened in Chula Vista, California, which is actually where I'm from. In fact, a lot of the search parties took place very close to me and and everyone in the community was just hoping that she would be found safe and alive. To this day, anytime I go to a Starbucks or a Target near my neighborhood, there are still flyers of Maya Malete posted up and people to this day are still looking for answers. But anyways, let's dive in and let's talk about what happened to Maya Miliete. May Maya Miliete was a 39-year-old Filipino-American who lived in the Chula Vista area of San Diego. She was born in the Philippines and was raised in Honolulu, Hawaii with her five other siblings. She attended and graduated from the University of Hawaii at Manoa. Maya met her husband, Larry Miliete, in high school after his family moved from San Diego to Hawaii. His family actually moved to Hawaii because Larry was involved in a juvenile gang-related assault arrest. So I guess his family was trying to get him away from any bad influences. Now, the two got married in the year 2000, and after their wedding, Larry served in the United States Navy for five years. After that, they moved to San Diego, and they had three kids who were aged 4, 9, and 11 at the time of her disappearance. I'm not going to share their names just for their privacy. Maya worked as a civilian employee of the United States Navy and was a contract specialist for the Naval Information Warfare Center. She was very close with her parents and her siblings and she talked to them pretty much on a daily basis. They all would hang out together. Maya really loved to go camping, hiking, and she was just an overall active person. People who knew her described her as smart, outgoing, kind, and a great mother. On top of that, she was absolutely gorgeous and from the videos I've seen of her she seemed like such a warm and sweet person on January 7th 2021 Maya was last seen by her family in the family's home on Paseo Los Gatos in Chula Vista nearby security footage showed her arriving home at around 4 45 p.m. she parked her car on the street and then walked inside her house However, there was never any footage of her leaving. The next day, on January 8th, Maya's brother, JR, started to grow concern for his sister, Maya. He hadn't heard from her the entire day, so he decided to drive to her house and check in on her. When he arrived, he says that he found Larry upstairs and his nieces and nephews inside the home. He asked one of Maya's daughters where their mom was, and they said that she had been locked in her room for about 11 hours. JR asked Larry what had happened, you know, why was his sister locked inside the room? And Larry told him that the night before, he and Maya actually got into a fight, and that since then, Maya locked herself inside the room and had not come out or spoken to Larry or the kids. Which to me is just very confusing because if your wife has been inside the room the entire day, how are you not finding that a bit odd? Like, wouldn't you knock or try to get inside the room to make sure that your wife was okay, especially since she hadn't spoken to the kids at all? And on top of that, she hadn't eaten anything, so I don't know why Larry didn't think that this was odd. Now, the next day on January 9th, this was actually Maya's daughter's birthday. The family had booked a trip to go to Big Bear to celebrate, but on that day, Maya never showed up. People tried to call Maya to get in contact with her to see what was going on, but they never heard from her. That same day, Maya's father, Pablito Tabalanza, went to the Miliete home very worried about his daughter. Now, Larry told him that Maya was still inside the bedroom, but when Pablito knocked on the door and called out to his daughter, no one answered. He asked Larry to open the door, and Larry actually had a key and unlocked it. And of course, when Pablito walked inside the room, Maya was nowhere to be found. They went to go check on Maya's car, and it was still parked outside, so this is when the family started to get very worried. 
On January 9th at around 11.18 p.m., Maya's sister, Mary Chris, called the police to report Maya as missing. She says that Larry was trying to downplay her sister's disappearance and said that she had just gone hiking. He even told her to wait until around 2, 2.20 in the morning to report Maya as missing. But Mary Chris knew that something was wrong and she couldn't wait any longer. Now, I think the first red flag is that Maya's husband wasn't the one to report his wife as missing. How did he not think it was odd that his wife literally missed their daughter's 11th birthday? This was something that they had planned for a long time, and she was so excited to celebrate this with her family. So the fact that she never showed up and that she just ditched this family trip is extremely suspicious. So let's get into the investigation. Police arrived to Maya's home on January 10th at 1 a.m. to begin the investigation. This is when they learned that the family hadn't actually seen her for three days now. So they immediately began searching because this was very odd. They started going around the neighborhood and they spoke to a neighbor who said that they saw the Miliete children playing outside the house after 10 p.m. on the night that Maya disappeared. Now, this neighbor thought that this was strange because it was a weeknight, it was very cold outside, so it was just a bit odd for the children to be playing out that late at night. Police continued looking around the neighborhood, and that's when they discovered that at 9.57 p.m. on January 7th, a security camera captured the sound of nine loud bangs, which police theorized could be gunshots coming from somewhere in the neighborhood. Now, this footage hasn't been fully analyzed, so it cannot be confirmed whether or not these loud bangs were actually gunshots. They checked Maya's phone records, and her last phone call was an outgoing call at 5.48 p.m. to a family law attorney in Carlsbad. This call lasted for 10 minutes and 20 seconds. Then, on January 8th at 1.25 a.m., Maya's cell phone either dies or is turned off, but its last location was at her house. It was also later discovered that earlier that that day, Maya had made an appointment to see a divorce lawyer. Now, of course, police wanted to look into Maya's husband, Larry. He was the last person known to have seen Maya, so police asked him where he was during Maya's disappearance. On January 8th, the morning after his wife's disappearance, Larry made a trip to Solana Beach with his four-year-old son. He was at this beach for over 11 hours, and his phone had been turned off from 6.45 a.m. to 6.34 p.m. that entire day. Now, this is odd. First of all, that day was very foggy and cold. So why would Larry take his four-year-old son on a cold beach day for 11 hours? And why was his phone turned off all day? I mean, did he not need his phone to get in contact with his wife to update her about the beach day or to get in contact with his other children? It just was very odd that he would just go completely MIA. So police also thought that this was strange and they actually went to go ask the lifeguards and the state park officers if they had seen Larry at the beach, but there were no witnesses or really any evidence to prove that Larry Larry had actually been there. Now, while Larry was at the beach for 11 hours with his son, he says that his daughter stayed at home with Maya. That same day, he was supposed to go to work, but he never showed up. Police go back to look at the neighbor's security footage, and that's when they see that the morning Larry went to the beach, he had backed up and repositioned his car into the garage. Now, when asked about this, he claims that he was simply pulling the car inside to load in a cooler with some snacks. But who knows? Now, I'm going to give a little bit of a timeline of the key moments that happened during the investigation. On January 23rd, police got a warrant to search the Miliete home. At this point, police said that Maya's whole family had been and continued to be cooperative in the search. Then, on February 4th, Mary Chris told news reporters that she was starting to feel desperate for answers. She also told the reporters that detectives on the case told her that Larry had lawyered up and was no longer cooperating with the investigation. The next day, on February 5th, there was a media briefing where Mary Chris pleaded with the public to keep the search going and for anyone with information to come forward. The police chief, Roxana Kennedy, also spoke and said that they were working around the clock on Maya's case. She also added that as a mother, she knows that Maya's kids meant everything to her, and knowing that she missed her daughter's 11th birthday really hit home with many detectives. 
To me, this sounds like police knew that Maya didn't run away, she didn't go hiking, she didn't go to a winery in Temecula like Larry claimed. I mean, the police and the family knew that something much worse most likely happened. Also, around this time, it came out that Maya and Larry were having marital issues for a year, but that they were going to see a counselor and were trying to work things out for the kids. But they had been pretty much off and on. And on January 3rd, just days before Maya disappeared, Maya and Larry had gone on a camping trip with Mary Chris and with her husband. Mary Chris said that Maya and Larry had a lot of arguments on this trip, so their relationship was not going well. On February 16th, police said that Larry was still not cooperating with police and wasn't helping out with the search parties anymore. Larry also didn't let the police ever interview his three kids, which is his right as a parent, but honestly, it makes a lot of people wonder if maybe the kids saw or knew something. On April 1st, a search warrant is executed at Larry's aunt and uncle's home in San Diego. Police seized guns and other evidence that hasn't been publicly stated. Now, later that month, the FBI officially joined the search. On May 7th, police got a second search warrant to investigate the Miliete home. Larry later said that on this day, he was pulled over and held in police custody for over six hours while they did the search, which obviously he wasn't happy about. The search resulted in police putting a temporary gun violence restraining order on Larry, but he claims that the guns that they seized are legally owned. Police got a third search warrant for the Miliete home on July 1st so that they could obtain additional evidence and clues. I remember when these searches were happening because there was news stations all over the place. Like the entire community was filled with vans, with news stations, with FBI agents. And I was actually there for one of the searches. Like I was standing outside with like a big crowd and it was so crazy seeing police like pulling out all of this evidence and taking out all of these boxes. And it just really made you wonder, you know, what actually happened to Maya? Going back to the timeline on July 22nd, Larry was officially named a person of interest, and the judge involved with his gun violence restraining order released two photos of Larry's gun collection. He had a total of 16 rifles and handguns. Meanwhile, that summer, Maya's parents, Pablito and Naomi, are battling in family court trying to get visitation with Maya's three children. Because at this point, Larry literally did not let any of Maya's family speak to the children. He didn't let Mary Chris, he didn't let Maya's parents. I mean, the only people that were allowed to be with Larry's kids were Larry himself and his own parents. And considering how close the family was, this was so difficult. I remember Mary Chris going on the Dr. Phil show and she was very to him saying, I just want to see my sister's kids. Like, I just want them to be close to family. And it just really was hurtful that they were so isolated and that they weren't able to, you know, grieve with the children because, you know, they also lost their mother. They don't know where their mother is. So it was just such a difficult time for the entire family. On September 8th, Larry says in court papers that he thinks Maya is still alive and that she voluntarily left. Larry wrote that she had left the house at least twice in 2020 without saying goodbye to him or the kids. However, on October 19th, Larry was arrested for Maya's murder. This arrest was shocking for multiple reasons, so at a briefing, the police chief and the district attorney gave more details into the investigation. They believe Larry murdered Maya on January 7th and then disposed of her body on January 8th. Now, if you remember, on January 8th, Larry went to the beach for 11 hours, so a lot of people wonder if he actually wasn't at the beach and instead he used that time to dispose of his wife's body. Larry's arraignment happened days after his arrest and he pleaded not guilty for the first degree murder of Maya and for a weapons possession charge. Larry wasn't granted bail because he was considered a danger to the community. On October 27th, Larry is back in court for violating the protective order that had been placed against him and the three children. He wasn't supposed to contact them, but Larry had made nine hours worth of calls from jail to the kids at all hours of the day. That includes during school hours and even a call at around 1.48 in the morning. Now, during all of this, the searches for Maya's body continued, but unfortunately, they were still unsuccessful. Since Larry was in jail, his parents had custody of the children. Mary Chris attempted to get temporary custody of the children, but the judge ruled against it. However, Maya's side of the family was allowed to have regular visits with the kids. 
On June 10th, Larry's attorney said that he wasn't competent to stand on trial, so the judge actually had to suspend the trial until Larry could get checked. However, after being evaluated by a psychiatrist, Larry was deemed mentally competent, so the trial would be moving forward. On January 11th, 2023, so just a few months ago, the preliminary hearing officially began. And to anyone who doesn't know, a hearing comes before a trial, so there is no jury. This happens so that a judge can decide if there is even enough evidence to actually have a trial. During the preliminary hearing, the prosecution would be calling 25 witnesses and the defense would be calling none. So I think we knew how this trial was going to go. Now, the first witness was Destiny Johnson, who worked at Broaden Law Office in Chula Vista. She confirmed that Maya called and scheduled an appointment with a divorce attorney on January 7th. She said that while on the phone with Maya, she gathered that she loved her kids and that she was terrified of what her husband's reaction would be to the divorce. Maya's brother also testified that Maya told him Larry was toxic and mentally abusive. Apparently, he was convinced that Maya was having an affair and he was monitoring all her emails, her text messages, her social media, and her finances to the point where she just stopped being friends with any guys. Other witnesses testified about Maya and Larry's marital problems and that Larry had said he was becoming desperate. Maya's co-worker, Derek Sopp, also testified and said, that in early 2020, Larry heard about a woman accusing Maya of having an affair with another co-worker. But this whole thing was a misunderstanding and everything was actually fine. However, Larry didn't agree with this. He started sending Derek frequent emails asking him to separate Maya and the other employee. In one email, Larry said that he thought moving the other employee to a different division would help Maya reset herself and the relationship as well. So Larry honestly believed that Maya was cheating even though she wasn't. Also, just sending those emails and trying to control what Maya was doing at her job is so inappropriate and the fact that he was basically telling the job to make sure that his wife didn't speak to any men is insane. And it honestly shows how controlling Larry was. And it just gets worse. Maya's phone records were reviewed by police, and in a text sent from the coworker to Maya, he said Larry had contacted his wife about the alleged affair and that he was worried for Maya's safety. A detective also testified that Maya and this coworker texted every day frequently, sometimes from a second Instagram account. He said that the messages seemed romantic and caring, but that they also just seemed to be friendly messages. Now, Maya had to have a second Instagram account, not because she was having an affair, but because Larry was always monitoring her. She had absolutely no privacy. Now, a close friend of Maya's testified that Maya had discovered Larry was trying to track her at all times, and she was so upset about this that she actually locked herself inside a room. Just imagine what Maya was going through. I mean, her husband was literally watching her. He was following her. He was tracking her and monitoring all her emails, text messages, social media, finances. I mean, this guy was so so controlling and Maya just felt so suffocated. On day seven of the preliminary hearing, Larry's search history was presented to the court and it was honestly shocking. He had searched terms such as subliminal wife training and training your wife subliminal nine times. He searched is manhandling your wife abuse five times. He also searched physical abuse manifesting years after in a marriage five times and can you track an iPhone if it's on airplane mode at least seven times. Larry also searched plant you take to never wake up and water hemlock, which is a very poisonous plant that can easily kill you if you eat any part of it. He also searched multiple different drugs that can incapacitate a person, including rohypnol, also known as roofies, the date rape drug. He had also searched some inappropriate sexual subliminals several times, but I'm not going to quote those. There was also testimony before the hearing that said Maya had found a cell phone hidden under her bed, but Larry said the hidden messages in them just said, I love you and love me. And if you guys don't know what a subliminal is, they're messages that play really sped up or quietly under music or white noise so that you can't consciously hear them, but your brain is still able to absorb the message. So basically, Larry was trying to mind control her. A letter written by Maya to Larry was also shown where she writes about finding the strength to initiate physically leaving and said, let me find my peace. 
I cannot find it with you. Larry sent a screenshot of a text message from Maya to his boss on January 6th, the day before Maya went missing, where Maya said in caps, I don't want to be your wife anymore. I'm filing whether you like it or not. I should have left a long time ago, and this time, I'm not going to look back and say that again. That same day, Larry told his boss that he couldn't come in because he said, it's been an exhausting day full of getting yelled at. I just can't fathom what's going on. This is surreal, like life is hopeless. Now, hearing all of that just makes you feel so sad for Maya. The fact that she found this phone under her bed with these subliminal messages and the fact that she sent that message to Larry said that she's trying to find her peace. It just really breaks your heart and I just feel so sad and just so frustrated that Maya was stuck in such a toxic and terrible relationship. On January 7th, the day Maya went missing, Larry's boss texted him and asked him what his ETA would be. Larry replied saying, I'm not right, and later texted him, I'm about to lose it. A secret recording Maya took of an argument that she and Larry had was also played in court. The argument was about Larry thinking that Maya was having an affair with her coworker. Larry was saying things like, I don't know what you guys were doing at 7 or 8 at night all the time. And one of Maya's replies was, so that's enough for you to wish death on me all the time? There was also footage played from a neighbor's security camera that showed something being burned in the Miliete backyard fireplace in May of 2021. And during one of the house searches, Maya's credit card was found burnt in that fireplace. If you remember, there were three searches of the house, and it seems like this was because of the tips that police were getting. Okay, so I know what I've mentioned is pretty insane, and it's very out there, but it just gets scarier from there. During the investigation, it was revealed that Larry reached out to multiple online companies who were selling spells, like magical spells, with the intention to cast a spell on Maya. I know, when I read that, my face literally was just like, in complete shock like this guy was really trying to cast a spell on his wife that's how desperate he was to keep her in control so the spells were originally meant to make maya obey larry or fall back in love with him this was one of the emails i would like a powerful love spell to bind my wife may t miliete to me forever also for her to love me unconditionally as i love her to keep her away from hurting our family even further she has become very promiscuous and selfish. She is only concerned about her happiness and disregards the happiness of her family. Our three young children are being affected. She rather go out with friends or probably meeting up with the third party. She has prioritized her work. She leaves me with our children whenever she is not working and puts no effort into spending time with them. Please see the details below. I have worked with Priest Wisdom and Dr. Mayawe from Nigeria with no results. Two spellcasters mentioned that someone has put a negative spell or voodoo on our relationship. Could be Jamie's wife when she found out about their relationship. Please cast the most powerful spell, you guys are my last hope. She has since not yet filed, but afraid I might report them at their employment. That's why she hasn't yet. Please help me. Please cast the best spell for my situation. Thank you so much in advance. Very respectfully, Larry I. Miliete. Again, thank you. Yeah, that is literally something that Larry wrote about his wife. He literally typed out this email and asked for someone to cast a spell on his wife. And the fact that he said that he had reached out to other spellcasters before is insane. I had no idea that this was even a thing. Like, I didn't know that brujeria was, like, actually real. I don't know if it is actually real, but the fact that this guy was going to those lengths to keep his wife in control and make her love him forever is insane to me. Now, since the spells weren't working, Larry wrote that it's time to take the gloves off. Larry wrote in an email, can you hex her to hurt her enough that she will have to depend on me and need my help? She's only nice to me when she needs me or sick. He made specific requests, like when the family had plans to go dirt bike riding for a spell that would make Maya crash and get stuck on bed rest. Again, this is all insane. The fact that he literally wanted his wife to get injured just so she would need him forever. And I feel like the people that were getting these emails definitely should have contacted the police. I mean, again, I had no idea that this was even a business, but the fact that these people were receiving emails of this man asking them to injure his wife 
life and didn't report it to the police is pretty shocking. In another email, I'm not exactly sure who Larry sent this one to, but he said, I think she wants me to snap. I'm shaking inside, ready to snap. Now, this is just proof that these things can never happen overnight. And when someone is acting this way, it has to be taken seriously. Now, to explain why Larry should go to trial, even without a body, the prosecution quoted from Charles Manson's case in his closing argument. He read directly from the 1977's People vs. Manson court document saying, the fact that a murderer may successfully dispose of the body of the victim does not entitle him to avoid prosecution. This is one form of success for which society has no reward. Production of the body is not a condition precedent to the prosecution for murder. Which I agree, just because there is no body does not mean that Larry should get away with this. Now, the prosecution also explained that Maya's missing body is actually circumstantial evidence that her death was caused by criminal means, because it's very unlikely that someone who suffered a natural death would dispose of their own body. Larry's defense team is still saying that without Maya's body and without evidence of a crime at the Miliete home or anywhere else, there really isn't anything to prove that Larry committed murder. The defense said that Maya could still be alive and they actually alleged that the affair could be a reason why Maya would disappear. I feel like they're trying to make it seem like Maya planned this whole thing, like kind of like a gone girl moment, like plan to just vanish, to go live off with her lover and just leave her kids and her family behind which again, the family says would never happen. On top of that, this lover that the defense accuses Maya of having isn't even missing. Like he's literally here in San Diego still. So they are just trying to make Maya seem like a bad person that planned to just abandon her family. But luckily the judge has sided with the prosecution saying that it was very unlikely that Maya left home willingly without ever contacting her family again. The judge agreed there is probable cause, so Larry will be going to trial. His trial date has been tentatively set for September 14th, so I will keep you guys posted on that. So let's talk about what we can do to help. Maya's body has never been discovered, but her family wants to give her the proper burial that she deserves. If anyone in Southern California was out on January 8th, 2021 and saw a black Lexus GX460, please let investigators know. It's estimated that Larry drove between 400 to 600 miles that day and that any sightings could potentially help to find Maya. My heart just breaks for Maya's family, especially for her three kids, so I hope that they're able to find her so they can get some sort of peace. And of course, I hope that there is justice for Maya Miliete. But all right, you guys, that is pretty much everything that I have on this case, but don't worry, I do have a new case coming next week. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening and watching. Don't forget to follow, rate, and review What Happened wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to Pass Your Bedtime on YouTube for full video episodes. You can find me on Instagram at the Jackie Flores and on TikTok at True Crime Jackie. Thank you again so much for being here, and I will see you guys in the next episode. Bye.